Uh, so last time I presented on uh, uh, um out of memory must fail fast. Um, by out of memory, I include both heap memory and stack. And this is uh, um, more generally a problem of uh, the, me the machine hitting a situation where it cannot continue according to the language spec. Uh, and uh, an exceptional thing has happened. Uh, and how to treat the exceptional thing. Right now, what many engines do is they throw a catchable exception at that point. Uh, and that means that, uh, a ex that the exception might happen at any moment, uh, such as during this console log in the middle of this array splice. It's the same example from last time. And there's really no reasonable thing uh, that you can do by catching and rec uh, um, the exception and trying to recover consistency. The only way to proceed forward from this point with any hope of correct execution, with any hope of understandable execution, um, uh, is to abandon all of, the all of the potentially corrupted state. And that means this data structure itself and uh, all other data structures from which this one is synchronously accessible. So one of the options that, um, that we discussed is that, well, first of all, a constraint on the proposal that came from the discussion last time is that the web currently depends on out of memory and out of stack resulting in catchable exceptions. And therefore, we cannot simply make it always fail fast uh, without breaking the web. And of course, our prime directive is don't break the web. Uh, so, uh, so one thing we need would be uh, a way to do an opt-in. Um, and the death before confusion here is not uh, intended to be a serious proposal for what the name of it is, but the point is that there be some mechanism to opt in, and once you opt in, then whatever the unit of preemptive termination, the unit of computation, all of which must be suspected to be corrupt at that point, that all of that gets abandoned on out of memory if anything within that unit had opted into this condition. And Waldemar pointed out that uh, it's not just an issue of machine thrown um, uh, exceptions. Uh, it's also an issue of the fact that in JavaScript, uh, pretty much everything you call might decide to throw an exception, and people adding new exception throws to existing uh, APIs uh, don't normally think of themselves as doing something that's not upwards compatible from the previous uh, case. So uh, the problem uh, is practically also the issue of um, if an exception happens in a situation where you were really counting on no exception happening, uh, how can you also call abandonment there? So um, Waldemar su suggested, I think he used the, fr the, t the term no throw. Uh, I, I should have consulted with Waldemar before putting the slide together, but this is just sort of my inference from, from the discussion uh, uh, last time and the discussion on a GitHub thread. Uh, so, the, so one thing we could imagine doing uh, is uh, placing critical sequences of code inside a no throw block um, where uh, if, an ex if execution of the, of the block itself terminates exceptionally, then the entire unit of preemptive termination, the entire unit that is now suspected to be corrupt, now gets abandoned. So this basically becomes an abort mechanism. And then on the uh, GitHub thread, it was observed that rather than introducing new syntax, uh, if there was an API that caused a uh, sudden termination of that unit of preemptive termination, uh, uh, whether it's called terminate or abort or whatever, you can, you can um, uh, that you, by simply putting this in the catch block, you can also 
for thrown exceptions that would corrupt data structures, you can put critical operations in something like that, where the terminate causes the sudden abandonment of that entire unit, uh, and by adding the error um, uh, argument there, you can provide diagnostic information about what the error is that caused the termination. Um, this is very, okay, very slow to update between here and the screen. Um, so the terminate um, does not subsume the need for the death before confusion uh, because uh, it's still the case that um, uh, if you didn't, if there was no opt-in for saying that out of memory and such low-level uh, errors in general uh, caused uh, termination, then one could still use the purposeful uh, inducing of out of memory to cause attacks, as we've actually seen in the wild, uh, as I as I showed an example of last time. Um, so altogether, what this um, turns into uh, is basically uh, two APIs with, the, with those two functionalities, leaving aside what the actual names are. Uh, and then there's the issue. So the remaining issue, and this is sort of the big hard issue, uh, is... Mark, uh, can you stop the APR statement there? I'm sorry? You made a claim that you need that you need both APIs. Uh, yes. Can you support that? Yeah. Um, the uh, the death before confusion doesn't deal with the case you were raising, which is a uh, 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 an exception that was thrown by user code that's considered normally a catchable exception, but happens to go through something that was a critical operation that wasn't prepared to recover from the critical exception. If you want to deal with that as well, then, the, then you need the terminate. Um, if you want to prevent attacks by inducing out of memory, uh, and out of memory itself is still just throwing a catchable exception, uh, places where you know you've done something critical that would be corrupted, um, uh, you can still use the terminate pattern to protect yourself. But uh, the, um, but an attacker could still cause an out-of-memory exception in a position where they're able to then catch it before it gets thrown through something critical. Um, and it is true that if you had marked everything critical with this terminate pattern, um, then the attacker inducing out-of-memory and then catching it uh, in theory, would not have actually corrupted the critical data structure, but they would have, corru but they would have corrupted pretty much uh, any other low-level stateful update that hadn't been able to complete. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to hypothesize that the issue you're, you're uh, questioning is whether we can just deal with terminate and make it programmer responsibility to mark all critical uh, 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 state um, state uh, updates uh, in order to restore uh, <laughs> consistency, and I think I think I can say that yes, that's an open question. It will it it's one to challenge, but I'd rather start with a position that I'm more confident is defensible, uh, and then. Um, on examination, maybe relax from there as we find that we can defend with less mechanism, rather than start with less mechanism and not a situation that I know to be defensible. So then the remaining hard question is, um, what is this unit of preemptive termination? Um, oh, is anybody taking notes? Okay, yeah. Also, uh, I am actually recording this part, so um, uh, so the, the so when I break for questions afterwards, if there's time, that will be the, the more important time to be taking notes. Uh, in any case, there's the unit of what is the unit the the 
um, the unit of preemptive termination. How much computation do we terminate either because of the, the opt-in or because of the explicit call to terminate? Um, once upon a time, the agent was a perfectly uh, valid unit the, um, where uh, objects within the same agent uh, have synchronous access to each other and therefore everything within the agent must be assumed to be corrupt. But it used to be the case that between different agents there was only asynchronous interaction. And then we introduced shared array buffers and with shared array buffers uh, introduced the notion of the agent cluster. Uh, and uh, or if the semantics of the shared array buffer uh, continues to be that the sudden preemptive termination of one participant in a shared array buffer uh, causes the other participants in the same shared array buffer to potentially be in a state from which consistency is unrecoverable, then uh, then, then something pot potentially as large as the agent cluster might need to be the unit that gets abandoned. Uh, I'm hoping that we can refine the semantics of shared array buffer uh, so that it becomes a, a firewall against the contagion of corruption uh, so that we can go back to only having the agent be the necessary unit of preemptive termination. But I want to uh, frame uh, this question in terms of a hierarchy of, uh, of containers of computation, each of whom have uh, issues of, um, of what's within the unit, how they relate to their container, and what it would mean to have reflective control of that unit. So we've got objects. We've got the notion of an import namespace, a module registry. We don't yet have a reified notion of the loader, but that's, that's coming. Uh, we've got a proposal for a compartment, which is essentially a reified evaluation context where you have multiple compartments per realm. So these are sort of successively coarser things, except that there is this open question of the unit of preemptive termination uh, um, uh, where you would associate a resource budget with that unit so it can exhaust that resource budget without exhausting the resource budget of whatever it's contained in so that it can be terminated when it exhausts its budget. And it's an open question of is this identical to one of the other units, agent or agent cluster, or is it somewhere between them? Um, uh, agents are right now understood as a unit of sequentiality, of sequential computation within the agent, but agents run concurrently with each other. Uh, uh, an agent cluster, uh, synchronous computation can happen within an agent cluster, but agent clusters are only asynchronously coupled to each other, so it seems like you don't have to go larger than the agent cluster. Um, uh, and then uh, I include just for completeness, for thinking about the overall ecosystem, um, that uh, the world of computation as a whole, the internet, the web, uh, is organized in also in terms of computation happening on separate machines where the machines are mutually suspicious and talking to each other uh, over cryptographic protocols where a machine or a data center is a unit of separate administration. The thing about mutual suspicion is uh, there's no common administ administrator across the internet. Um, in the browser, uh, the, um, there's the issue of what happens. The browser gives us a good um, context for examining what happens on termination, uh, such as making tabs dead or, or forcing a refresh. Uh, site isolation would align uh, the process notion uh, uh, um, with the uh, origin notion. So, pro so origin and process did not appear previously because they aren't JavaScript concepts. Um, uh, in the embedded context, there is a booting de there's rebooting devices. In a transactional context, you can think of terminate as aborting a transaction, falling back to a previously consistent state. Um, and the Erlang, uh, Erlang language and the Kikos operating system 
uh, show that building highly reliable systems that are resilient to their own bugs, uh, the key element is fail-stop components and the ability to have uh, supervisors or keepers that are outside the component that run on other resources that can react to the sudden failure of the component. Uh, is Peter here? Downstairs. Downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Peter, are you online? Okay. So I'm going to skip these two slides because they were for Peter to talk to, but th basically this is... Oh, unless Patrick, uh, could you... Do you want to talk to these two slides? Are you prepared for that? That's the next slide, yeah. These were the two slides I got from Peter. Okay. Uh, what we intend to do next is um, to switch uh, something that allows a new virtual machine with plastic star to uh, to know why the one failed. Could be just a number. Okay. So it could be like a long explanation. Uh, so the behavior of the new Okay, and Peter arrived just too late for that. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, uh, so Agoric uh, is, um, our plans are to actually use the XS virtual machine. The XS virtual machine is, of course, built primarily for embedded devices, but we're actually planning to use it on blockchain for running smart contracts. Uh, and uh, we're, we have this unit of deterministic replication, which is this swing set, which is a set of JavaScript, what we call VATs, which are essentially agents but without shared array buffers. Um, but we're going to do a, a resource allocation per VAT, even though there's no concurrency between the VATs. The VATs are only asynchronously coupled, so you can terminate them separately with, while preserving consistency. There's no concurrency here, so they're not really separate agents in the conventional manner. Um, uh, but we need to be able to terminate them separately with sep giving them, having given them separate budgets um, uh, so that the swing set as a whole can continue to operate after any one VAT has exhausted its budget while leaving the swing set as a whole as a unit of deterministic replication. So that just, uh, you know, raises more questions, creates um, more degrees of freedom in what the right unit of preemptive termination is and how it relates to agents versus agent clusters versus whatever. And then, of course, our overall system is multiple swing sets running on multiple machines, some blockchains, some non-blockchains, uh, talking to each other over cryptographic protocol with objects in one, in one VAT sending messages both through the swing set and then across the network over cryptographic protocols to objects running in other VATs. Uh, and 
um, uh, the whole story about preemptive termination also has to be consistent with what happens when a machine crashes or, or a network partitions to, to bring it out into a similar overall failure model. So the remaining element of the API is just like we're creating a compartment API for reifying the notion of an evaluation context and having reflective access for controlling it and reifying a notion of a realm um, that there would be uh, a, that reifying an agent through a agent API so that you can have reflective control of what happens within the agent uh, for whatever the unit of preemptive termination is uh, uh, I, I would imagine that eventually we would have a, a reflective reification for the ability to create one of those and to on creation provide a handler uh, where the handler includes an error keeper, a supervisor in the Erlang terms. What are you calling an agent in this uh, uh, so, uh, the, uh, so agent was an example, um, uh, but, but quite literally, given that the spec has a concept of agent and a concept of agent cluster, uh, assuming that the current spec um, categories of those things remain in place, then just like the spec has an unreified notion of realm, which we're now going to reify, I would expect actually we would have uh, eventually an agent API and an agent cluster API for, for programmatically creating new agents and creating new agent clusters. An example of something, different issues are properly reified through, uh, through different reflective APIs in order for JavaScript code to act as host to other JavaScript code. Uh, so for example, um, uh, when JavaScript code delegates to the host the question of is evaluation enabled? That's something that's appropriate to be done at the compartment level. When JavaScript uh, delegates to the host uh, to say uh, what's the next job that should be allowed to run among the different jobs on the different job queues, that doesn't make sense at a compartment level, it doesn't make sense on an agent, on a, on a realm level, it only makes sense on an agent level because the, uh, the job queues are agent-wide. You can have synchronous turns that, that go through multiple realms within one agent. Um, so whatever the unit is that's associated with the unit of preemptive termination, that would be the thing that you reify for which you provide a keeper, where the keeper gets invoked with the resources of the outer code when the inner code, the code within that unit of preemptive termination, gets terminated. Um, so on the inside, when code, let's say, throws an error inside a no-throw block, then on the outside, the code that ran these first two lines, the error keeper would get called with not the same error object, because there's no shared heap, but a copy of the error object that contains an adequate copy of the diagnostic information, so the diagnostics can can diagnostic information can be carried across to explain what the problem was. And that's it. Now that I'm officially breaking for questions, I will also officially turn off recording.